Hello, a very good morning. It is great to have you with us on Ireland AM. It is Thursday, the 6th of April. It is, and we've got a busy show lined up to bring you one step closer to the long weekend. Now, uh, before we get to all the fun stuff with a recent report showing people lose money by staying loyal to their bank, we're going to be looking at the best rates to save yourself a pretty penny. And for some people, that's super fun. Absolutely. Getting the Excel sheet out, comparing them all. Some people. If that's you, we've got just the thing. Also, I'm envious of you if that is. Like, I'd love to be good at that stuff. Oh, my God. People who like banking admin, oh. we are the best. Uh, now, forget parenting perfection. Yes. Yes, is that a thing? We hear more about a new book that explores the highs and lows of becoming a parent and the pressures of the fourth trimester once no, they're out. About it. Absolutely. The fourth tri is that did you know that did you call it the fourth trimester when no, they came? No, did not, but I knew all about it. As soon new as phrase. It happened. There you go. The end of the sleep. Plus from Pamela Anderson to Prince Harry, we're gonna be chatting to the New York comedians behind the podcast, which delves into the most popular celebrity memoirs. I love it. It's a brilliant podcast. I laugh all the time. Looking forward to chatting with them later on. Alan, is it over? Reading all of the papers. All of the papers in front of me all now. Of the papers. Later on, our science expert Phil Smith will be here to show us how we can have lots of fun with eggs, but not the uh, chocolate kind as we are coming up to Easter. Plus, Alberto Rossi whips up the ultimate Italian comfort dish. So, looking forward to that a little later on. And Derek is living his football fantasy this morning. What's your football fantasy, Derek? What have you got in store for us? <laughs> well, Daniel, you'll find out in a few minutes' time. Uh, we're live here in Visbra in Dublin 7. Weather-wise, it's uh, a wet start in across eastern and midwestern areas, but that lovely sweet ridge of high pressure uh, building into the Easter Bank holiday weekend. Now, some nice sunshine on the cars. We promise you, fingers crossed, uh, later on today. But Daily Man Park, just over my shoulder, the home of Bohemians FC. A historic night on Friday night, actually. Uh, for the first time ever, Virgin Media Television will be carrying its first League of Ireland game, both taking on Shamrock Rovers live coverage on Virgin Media 2 from 7.30pm uh, this Friday so we'll be getting a preview of the game a little bit later on uh, this morning the question is guys are you a Bose fan or are you a Shamrock Rovers fan which one are you? Oh, that's a good question Derek Limerick and City fan you're from Limerick Derek you're from Limerick Monaghan United yeah well Limerick FC yeah. uh, but Tommy <laughs> Bow Bohemian is, FC it is great that the League of Ireland is going to be shown but Derek you mentioned it's raining like are we sunshine coming like it's coming up to start of yeah, April Tommy, I just told you, the sunshine on the way later on. Okay, right, I'm going to hold you to that. It's the Easter weekend, I want to see the sun out for us, fingers crossed, absolutely. Before we started talking to Derek um, on air, Tommy was like, Derek, when's the sunshine? He went, later on today, Tommy, and it took the wind out of your sails, yeah, didn't did, it? But I don't think he's been serious. Fight. Anyway, we will find out, but now it is time to get the news over to you, Anne O'Donnell. Thanks, Tommy. Good morning. A man in his 40s has been arrested for the murder of Eddie Hutch Sr. in 2016. The 59-year-old taxi driver was shot dead at his Dublin home on Poplar Road days after the deadly Regency Hotel attack. Garthy believe Eddie Hutch was targeted in the hutch Kinahan feud for simply being a member of the Hutch family. US President Joe Biden will address a joint sitting of the Houses of the Oireachtas when he visits Ireland next week. Well, president Biden will become the fourth US president to do so next Thursday. And Dublin will be not the only stop on the US president's agenda while he's here. More details of his itinerary were revealed yesterday, including confirmation of visits to Belfast, Louth and Mayo. In Ballina as well, preparations are already underway to welcome him. Stars and stripes proudly on display in Ballina as excitement grows over a much-anticipated visit for one of the town's most famous sons. Yesterday, the White House confirmed President Joe Biden's itinerary for his visit to Ireland next week. And much to the delight of locals here, Mayo is included on the agenda. His ancestors left the area over 170 years ago, but the link between the Bidens and Ballina remains strong. He's visited twice on two occasions in 2016 and 2017 and it's very much building on those connections and the relationship which is very sincere. It's not an engineered one and the ties between Balna and the US, in particular Scranton, his hometown, are very strong. So we're looking, to, looking forward to welcoming him home and celebrating those connections. President Biden kicks off his tour of the island of Ireland in Belfast on Tuesday before travelling south of the border for engagements in Louth, Dublin and, of course, the highly anticipated homecoming in Mayo. Hannah Lamas, Virgin Media News. 
A murder investigation is underway in Limerick this morning. It follows the fatal assault of a woman in an apartment on Dock Road in the city on Tuesday afternoon. Gardaí are now appealing to anyone who has information to contact them and also ask that anyone who has camera footage from the Dock Road and O'Curry Street areas from between 1pm and 2pm on Tuesday the 4th of April to contact them. 58 school building projects which had been on hold have been given the green light to move to tender and construction stage. Well, these projects had been stalled for a number of months due to funding constraints. Additional funding has now been secured and the schools will all be contacted directly by the Department of Education. No, I, I think to be fair, you know, we're not unique in the education sector in that we have been impacted by the war in Ukraine in terms of, I suppose, the um, cost of materials that has impacted us greatly. Um, we've also had more than 15,000 young people from Ukraine um, into our schools, which is very welcome. Um, and we've also accelerated special education delivery, which is very important. Um, and I suppose to be fair as well, you know, right throughout COVID, we in the Department of Education continued to build when others were not. Uh, and we've accelerated our building uh, programme really since the this government was conceived. Well, the US President Joe Biden is going to get some competition for the Democratic nomination in the US from one of the most powerful names in American politics. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has filed paperwork with the Federal Election Commission to run for the Democratic nomination for president. The 69-year-old environmental lawyer and anti-vaccine activist is the son of the former New York Senator and Attorney General who shared the same name and is also the nephew of the late President John F. Kennedy. And finally for now, residents of London Zoo have been celebrating Easter early. Zookeepers acted as Easter, bun Easter bunnies to deliver brightly coloured Easter eggs to meerkats, squirrel monkeys and tigers. Well, nine-month-old critically endangered Sumatran tiger cubs sniffed out cinnamon-scented eggs while the meerkats got eggs filled with moss and crickets. And the eggs given to the Bolivian squirrel monkeys were stuffed with steamed sweet potato, sweet corn and peas. And there's live football tomorrow on Virgin Media 2 as Bohemians face Shamrock Rovers in the SSE or Tristy League. 2022 Grand National winning trainer Emmett Mullins says he's encouraged by the fact that last year's winner Noble Yates has been there and done it. Mullins is looking to make it back-to-back -back Grand National wins at Aintree next week. Just over a week to go until the Aintree Grand National Festival and at the home of the 2022 winner, preparations are kicking up a notch. Noble Yates took everyone by surprise when he won the Grand National last year. Trainer Emmett Mullins is hoping he can produce some of the same magic this year. That's it, you have to rise to the occasion and, um, and take to the fences. There's a lot of different factors involved in Aintree and um, uh, it's a great source of comfort and just knowing that we've been there and done it and he, he's taken to it well. The horse is in good form and uh, he's taken to the fences before so it's, it's, going, to be, it's going to be a very hard task but uh, hopefully uh, he's none the wiser and can uh, react to it. While Noble Yates looks for back-to-back -back successes down the road at Shark Hanlon's yard, winner of the American Grand National Hewick will be staying at home after his fall at the Cheltenham Gold Cup. But Shark might still have something special up his sleeve. Yeah, Cape Gentleman, he's going around there behind us. He, um, he's a horse that donors of him now rang me to buy a horse for him. They wanted to buy Hewick and the owner wasn't selling him. So they rang him, rang to know could I get a horse from The owners, their relations um, I think it's a grandfather had the winner at a hundred years ago, and um, they're all there's 30, 40 of them coming over. They have a box taken, I think, for the last 10 years in Liverpool, and they had no horse, but they have a horse now. We got them qualified, and uh, they're delighted to have a runner. The countdown is on to the biggest race of the year. Amory Keegan, Virgin Media Sport. That's your sport for now. We'll have more for you at half seven. Now, what's the weather like out there this morning? Here's Derek. For car insurance, van insurance, or home insurance, call the Quote Devil. Unless, of course, you've got money to burn. 
Thank you, Ger, and a very good morning. We're coming to you live here from Fisbra in Dublin, 7 Daily Mount Park, just over my shoulder. And as Ger mentioned in the news there, we're going to be previewing that Dublin derby as Shamrock Rovers take on Bowes. Uh, live coverage on Virgin Media 2 this Friday from 7.30. So that's all to come inside the stadium later on this morning. Now, let's take an opening look at weather together with Oshie Moore with us on cameras once again this Thursday. And it is a bit of a damp start into eastern areas out there this morning. Plenty of scattered showers trailing around northern Leinster and parts of Clare Limerick into North Tip uh, not escaping either but elsewhere it is holding mainly dry and settled now in those light to moderate west to northwesterly breezes now right across this afternoon in fact we're going to see a nice improving picture finally after those couple of days of rain we're going to see a return to spring sunshine on the cards that lovely uh, ridge of high pressure is going to build up from the south and that will bring with it some good spring rays out there today uh, some nice countrywide sunshine a little bit of cloud cover mixed in for good measure 9 to 13 degrees is what we're talking in terms of temperatures. And finally, tonight it looks like mainly dry and settled. Uh, we'll clear out for a time, allowing for some mist and fog to develop. Touch of a frost too, because it will be a very cold night ahead. We're talking sub zero values, in fact, with uh, temperatures falling back to minus one to plus five degrees. So that's how it's shaping up here in a damp fields for in Dublin 7. At the moment, we'll be back again live at 7.35. For first-time drivers, young drivers, returning drivers, if you've had an open claim or have had too many penalty points. Now, new figures uh, today show that the Department of Housing's underspend of... Don't play a game with this one. 1.52 billion could have funded construction of more than 4,000 affordable homes. Sinn Féin say it's red tape and bureaucracy, whilst the government point to COVID and the war in Ukraine. Let us know what you think on this and saying already in 2023, there are 232 uh, million, million below that budget as well. 0896 111 We're going to be discussing that and a lot more after this short break. Welcome back. It's time now to take a look at this morning's papers. We're going to start with the Irish Times. It's headline, Department failed to spend one billion earmarked for housing. The Department of Housing has failed to spend more than one billion euro. That was earmarked for housing over the past three years at a time when the state was mired in an unprecedented housing crisis. 60,000 mortgage holders now trapped with vultures. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. Thousands more mortgage holders. Holders are trapped with vulture funds than was previously thought. Close to 60,000 are now mortgage prisoners of the vulture analysis shows. Nobody gave us eviction figures. That's the top story on the Daily Mail. The Taoiseach has insisted the Cabinet was not presented with figures showing nearly 7,000 termination notices were pending before it made its decision to end the eviction ban, even though the analysis was sent to the Housing Minister's office. <laughs> Lord. We'll discuss that in a minute. The Sun leads with killer dies in a blaze. A convicted killer and sex beast has died in a raging house fire in County Cork. The uh, star goes with killer on the loose. Gardaí have launched a murder hunt for a runaway killer who stabbed a young woman to death in Limerick earlier in the week. The Examiner leads with IFA chief dismisses Citizens Assembly eco levies. The country's main farming body has expressed serious concerns about the report of the Citizens Assembly on biodiversity law, suggesting some of its recommendations could actually be counterproductive to the overall objective of protecting biodiversity. The Herald leads with pistols at Dole. Armed Secret Service agents will have to stay behind a doorway two metres from US President Joe Biden as he addresses the houses of the Iraq this next week because we don't allow guns in the door. Mm. Mm. And finally, the mayor also leads with Joe Biden's visit. It's headline, Here Comes the Sun. The country is preparing to welcome a son of Ireland home when Joe Biden arrives next week, Leo Bradker has said. He's been here before, hasn't he? Well, Joe not, Biden, as not as president. No. When oh, you get the a, title, it's, it's going to be a big, big thing. deal. We've seen the cars coming in, the beast is in Ireland. It's oh. all ready to rock, means business. But it's great to see him. It is. It's it fantastic. Will, will Fair play to him, especially him. for what it's about, the 25th anniversary of the Friday Agreement. Absolutely. Now. I wonder, will he want to discuss this in... Um, Andrea Gilligan, why not? Should we talk about this? The yes, Department of Housing's massive underspend was revealed. Leo uh, now admits ministers' offices did 
have the eviction data and campaigners have said sex education books removed from the junior cycle. Lots to discuss. We've got lots to discuss. That was it. Andrea Gilligan is here from News Talk. Good morning. It's lovely to have you here, Andrea. Um, amazingly, the Americans have brought up the lack of housing in Ireland, saying, well, we can't invest in you anymore because you don't have any place to put people. So this is one billion euro that was earmarked for spending. It would have been 4,000 houses they could have built. What the hell is going on? Yeah, so um, last month we learned that it was reported the government had failed to spend just over about one billion of its capital allocation since 2019. And now this morning we have figures that have been obtained from the Sinn Féin housing spokesperson, Owen O'Brien, that that figure actually sits for the period of 2020 to 2022 is actually at 1.52 billion. This is the Department of Housing's budget that was earmarked um, for housing allocation. But I suppose quite crucially, what it also included was the 1 billion uh, euro intended for social and affordable housing. And I know there's people sitting at home this morning listening to millions and billions, and there's loads more figures you can you can look at and discuss as well. But as you mentioned, Maren, I suppose, the actual hard facts, the reality of all of this is that that, you know, one billion euro that was earmarked for the social and affordable housing, that would have built 4,000 homes. And at a time when we're listening to 11,700 people living in a form of emergency accommodation, this unspent budget of one billion would have taken about a third of those living in emergency Probably accommodation. Probably more because you're talking about families Absolutely. as well who are in emergency accommodation. We could have taken a huge amount of people out of that. It would have taken uh, about 4,000, as you said, 4,000 social um, homes, those those people out of emergency accommodation and, and into a house with a, with a roof over their head. And I think that's, you know, you're talking about a period of time where there's been so much discussion. I mean, even uh, the eviction ban in, in recent weeks, um, the whole, I think, government policy, government's time, its tenure in government, a lot of it has been, you know, dominated by discussions around housing and our handling of the housing situation. Mm -hmm. And I think for people sitting at home this morning, having their breakfast, listening to this, to hear that there's, you know, a billion euro that was earmarked for housing in the past three years, not spent, underspent, People and, are asking why. And, and this why year alone, they're actually slower than what they were last year in terms of building houses as well. We're already at 232 million below the budget. And like, it's frightening to think that even the surplus that's been brought into the budget has been kept for a rainy day fund. Yeah, well, you can so, keep about 10, or sorry, 10 of it, I should say, mm. um, in terms of, I suppose, a, a carryover. You can carry it over into the next year. That's set under, I suppose, a budgetary requirement. But you might ask, why did this not happen? Like, why is there this, this underspend, these figures that we're hearing this morning? Government, Department of Housing, will say that a huge proportion of this is down to COVID and the COVID restrictions. Yeah. And the reality is that construction sites for a period of time during 2000 and, uh, 2020 to 2022, under the COVID restrictions, construction sites were closed for a period of time. So that, in turn, halted the development of housing. Uh, they've you, also... would, you would think, though, I mean, the underspend in 2020, which was the peak COVID, was only 92 million. Where actually last year, 2022, when we thought we were past COVID, it was 471 million, which is the highest in those three years. I suppose we've had a lot of the discussion as well, and, and the, what Department of Houses or Housing are saying on this. We've had the issues that have arisen from the Russian Ukraine, um, the yep. Russian invasion of Ukraine. We've had challenges around, you know, cost inflation. Yeah. They were, um, they were energy under, situation, electricity. Look, they were underbuilding yeah, yeah. before COVID. Anyway, this has continued, and they have to do something about it. Owen O'Brien asking those questions. Yeah. Well, his point on that is: look, it's red tape, it's bureaucracy. Yeah. Uh, it's people it doesn't, on it. Is, it is this bureaucracy that apparently? The housing minister, Daryl Bryan, was given the figures. Oh, by the way, this is how many people are on eviction notices. Should you get rid of the eviction ban? They're like, we didn't see, we didn't, yeah. we didn't see them. Seven thousand. Seven thousand uh, tenancies is is what we're hearing. Um, cabinet have been informed of. Leo Bradford, the Taoiseach. Seven thousand. Leo Bradford, the Taoiseach, rejects that. Says that that what that information wasn't presented. Those figures weren't presented to cabinet in the days leading up to that decision. Um, What's really interesting about this is that Peter McFerry, who's so well known to many people, the, the, the homeless charity campaigner, he was out this week and said that the housing minister, uh, Darrow O'Brien, had actually sought to continue the eviction ban and that, that he had been overruled by the Taoiseach Leo Varadkar. And there's been a lot of to and fro about this in, in recent days, over the past three days, uh, a lot of discussion around it. Um, but Leo Varadkar came out yesterday and said that wasn't the case. And actually, Peter McFerry has rolled back 
and said if these figures, these 7,000 termination notices of eviction, if they weren't presented, then that's the case, that it was an unfortunate Un phrase and, and that has since happened. Okay. But I suppose ultimately when you're, when you're kind of, you know, dotting I's and crossing yeah. T's with somebody like Peter McFerry and, yeah. and you know, who's, who's a homeless campaigner, um, I think that kind of raises a lot of eyebrows for people. But like, there's just... It just seems incredible that the government knew that the 7,000 termination notices well, that they were sent into the housing department, but that the cabinet weren't being made aware yeah, of well, this. The, it just, yeah, yeah, like it's, just have to ask a lot of questions about it. And then the fact that a lot of people Leo Varadkar actually of said, even if we did know that, it still wouldn't have impacted our no, decision. No, he says that the, like it wouldn't have influenced their unanimous decision to, to lift the eviction ban. It's the Residential Tenancies Board yeah. provided this information to the Department of Housing. And I see one of Dar O'Brien, the Housing Minister, spokespeople out this morning, uh, making the point that, like, look, lots of information comes in mm. to the department. It has to be analysed. It has to be, I suppose, critically um, yeah. evaluated and that that information hadn't actually been presented. Listen, it's housing. This is going to happen. Uh, do you want to comment on this? 0896 111 Is it getting, like, COVID at this stage? And you're it, like, I can't take it into my brain anymore. But how frustrating is it's it unbelievable. at the minute? It's and absolutely if crazy. If we're hearing these figures at the minute, now, just so, so annoying. But there's this other story, and this is in the Irish Times today. Reading list cut from sex education after complaints. What's this about, Andrea? So there's a lot of controversy about this um, book. It's, it's a book that's part of the religious and sexuality education. It's not on the curriculum. It's an additional recommended reading, reading. book, yeah. and it's called uh, This Book is Gay. And I suppose it's a non-fictional book that explores growing up as a teenager, as an L uh, LGBTQ plus teenager. Yep. Um, and it talks about lots of different things. It gives detailed advice. And I suppose one of the areas and where there is a lot of criticism um, is around advice around um, sex and sexual positions. Um, and, and I suppose other kind of components, you know... So of, giving of children that. information, LGBTQI plus children information as to how they may be having sex in the future. Yeah, right. so it's, it's a book, because it's a recommended reading book on the, in the junior cycle, it means that it would be effectively kind of aimed at the 12 to 15 year old, the early secondary school yeah. um, age bracket of students. Now, where the discussion and the commentary and the criticism has come from, actually, in many cases, it's, it's from parents because parents feel it's too detailed, um, they think it's kind of a la it's a lapse of judgment even having this information contained within the book. And then supporters of the book, This Is Gay, say that it's a, it's a criticism, it's a critique of, um, it's an attack on, on LGBTQ plus on members. Their, their lives and how yeah, they live them. Yeah, and, um, and a lot of people feel that, it's, I suppose in many ways, it's actually, you know, uh, you know, restricting so freedom of speech. Not, it's not on the curriculum. It's just recommended it's an, reading. It's a recommended so reading. So if you did have a child who wanted to read it, you know, have given them that, them that opportunity, it shouldn't really be a problem, should it? I suppose ultimately my position on it would be, and we've discussed this many times actually on the show, like, you know, find me a teenager up to junior start who doesn't have a phone and access to Google. And I suppose the reality is that this is information that yeah. children that teenagers can easily access mm -hmm. through their laptop, through their iPad and, and, and through their mobile, and, and they're doing that. I suppose, you know, the, the whole purpose and the supporters of the book feel that it is important to have, if you want to call it an explainer, I've looked at the book, I've read yeah. many extracts from the book, we, we've discussed it with parents on the show, and it is that. It is an explainer, if you want to call it that, of what... Of, of sexual positions. Yeah. Um, but a lot of people feel that's just not appropriate content for, for 12 to 15 year olds. And a lot of people is have 12 is is young. About it. But it is, is there, young. The, well, we're just after hearing, we had a discussion in here a minute ago where a, a parent uh, involved in this show were like, well, I saw my son's phone recently and the stuff that was on it that was sent in a group chat was unbelievable. So informing them in the right way, is that what we should be doing? I, and, and are there the same complaints when it's about heterosexual sex? I think And for, explaining what that is. I think for a lot of par parents, Marin, as well, I think it's... it's the shock you, of knowing what your kids know. Perhaps, maybe. yeah. But it's also, I suppose, do you want... How accessible do you want this information for your children? Do you want it sitting um, at the back of the class you know, in a book, in the school library that is perhaps easily obtained? Or, you know, do you want to just maybe let your children find out about it themselves, um, themselves through their mobile? And I think maybe it just raises... It's, 
it's a decision that parents maybe have to make. But I think for a lot of parents, this is what I found out from talking to them on the programme about it, yeah. they want the control of making that decision. Um, where they might have, we'd say, you know, parental controls in mm -hmm. their kids' phones and that this isn't maybe, you know, information that's easily accessible at the, the back of the I class. mean, it, it says here, although it's initially recommended for readers aged 15 and older, Children's Books Ireland said it found the language and tone in parts better suited to older teenagers and young people outside of the Children's Books Ireland 0 to 18 age. Lots of different so, let us know what you think on this. 0896 111 What do you make? Welcome back. New research from the ESRI shows that customers are missing out on savings by not shopping around when choosing a bank and failing to consider switching for a better deal. We've just been having a chat about card readers. <laughs> card readers. Does anyone have a card uh, reader? Here with everything you need to know on changing banking provider is Dara Cassidy from Bankers.ie. Hello, Dara. It is lovely Hi. to chat to you. So let's talk about this ERSI uh, report. Mm -hmm. how, how much are we missing out on by not... Yeah, shopping around. we're missing out by, by, by a lot. I mean, the report unfortunately corroborates a lot of previous research that has been done and it shows that when it comes to financial services products such as credit cards, loans, mortgages, current accounts, not only do people not shop around, so they, all, they often go with the worst deal or the wrong deal because they're not comparing the markers. When they do then sign up for that deal, they don't then switch. So it's kind of the worst of both worlds. People not looking for better value when they're taking out the product in the first place and then people not switching every few years to get better value. So you, you hear all the time about switching mm -hmm. internet providers yep. or even mortgage providers, mm -hmm. you know, which is a bit more difficult. Yes. But switching banks, because mm -hmm. I kind of think you set up a bank whenever you're, when you're a nine teenager. And you're, yeah. Or someone does it when you're born and, and you're you just never move. For good. It is, yeah. So it, what, what are the benefits of actually switching banks? Well, it's about saving money. From I a mean, personal point of view, not business-wise. Yeah, I mean, from a personal point of view, it's about, it can be saving money, it can be getting a better service. Uh, most people probably switch their mortgage throughout their lifetime from a money savings point of view. But as you said, sometimes that can be a little bit more difficult. When it comes to a bank, I mean, yes, you're right. Usually we go down at the age of 14 or 15 15, our parents make us sign up for bank, then they Come have on, us. Come on, Henry Hippo. Yes. We were all lured <laughs> in by Henry Hippo. And then Hippo. they have us for the rest of their lives. And it's like kind of shooting fish in a barrel because when you then maybe sign up for, let's say, AIB or Permanent TSB years and years ago, you then take out your mortgage with them, you take out yep. your loan with them, you don't then compare the markers. But you can save money by switching your current account. Obviously, a lot of people have had to do it recently with the closures of the two banks. Yep. Um, but even by switching your credit card, but mortgage is probably where the big savings will be. Okay, so but let's talk about someone who wants to switch their bank because yes. let's be honest we've got interest rates all over the place the yes. highest they've been in years but there's no interest rates been given to us via savings no. wonder why that's happening yeah but if you want to it the research shows that you know men are more likely to switch their bank than women mm -hmm. which i totally get i would never even dream of switching my current account if you wanted to do it is it a lot of hassle? What's the very first step? You go, okay, I am with this bank. I don't want to be with them anymore. I want to move to yeah, this bank. So, so there is a, a switching code that you can use. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the switching code. I think it needs to be updated. I think the central bank needs to look at it. If I was looking at switching to a new current account, maybe it's, let's say, Revolut, you want to go down the digital route, or maybe it's permanent GSB, I would set up the new account first. And you can usually do that pretty quickly and easily now with all of the banks. They allow you can, to do it online. Can you? You can. So it's pretty similar, actually, to how you can do it with Revolut. So Revolut is only two, has over two million uh, yeah. users at the moment, so most of your viewers probably have an account. But, but say for someone, but say was. for someone who wants to go to a traditional bank, just to be on the, you know, and yes. can you go online? on their banking app or online onto their website and go, I want to set up yes, an account. Yes, you can. can. Passport, yes. don't you? You do, and you can take a picture oh. and you can take a selfie. Uh, sometimes, though, if you need to open up a joint account, though, that's where people can kind of get into trouble. That's when you have to go into the branch and you have to start setting up paperwork and okay. signing forms <laughs> and all sorts. Okay. But if you just want to set up a new account, you can do that pretty quickly and easily uh, in the space for a few minutes. And then once you have that new account set up, you can then look at your direct debits, your standing orders, and gradually get them, you know, Kind of changed over and then of course update your employer to let them know that they need to do, put money into a new account. Do you see banks or traditional banks we're seeing them closing down all over the country mm -hmm. at the minute and we see as you mentioned the likes of Revolut and Monzo these other banks that are becoming so much more available and easy to use on mm -hmm. the likes of your telephone. Do you think you see more people going that way? 
I, I do, but I'd be kind of quick to kind of to kind of sound the death knell for banks just yet. I mean, we do it all yeah. the time, for example, even in the, um, even in kind of you know, retail, people are always talking about the death of Marks and Spencers and so on. And there they are still making hundreds of millions. Um, Revolut, I think, recently came out and announced that it had made a profit of maybe a few, not even 100 million. Yeah. Bank of Ireland and <clears throat> ARB are making profits of up to a billion. So I think it's going to be a while before we see the death of the traditional banks. But I do think the you know, the online banks... Which I mean, is profits of up to a billion uh, yeah. are not giving us anything on a savings account. Yeah, not a I bit mean, of an interest yes. rate. And their bloody apps are useless. <laughs> <laughs> like, put your money into that. Can I have yeah. your card reader? Oh, Give me your start. card reader. <laughs> But that's it. You know, but get I think it with they the will. Times. Keep, yeah, no, but they will. I think keep the, the the traditional banks on their toes. And recently, um, Revolut obviously launched Irish IBANs, which will make it much easier for people to use Revolut mm. for the day to day banking. But do you sometimes like be able to go into a bank and see? To be honest, that's yeah. what I like. I like yeah. to no. be able to go in. If there's someone sitting here right now, are there banks that have best rates, or is it all kind of the same? No, absolutely. There's banks that have best rates, and this is why the research from the SRI was quite worrying. Absolutely, shop around when it comes to a mortgage. Just quick. If you're a first-time buyer at the moment, let's say borrowing €270,000, yeah. you could either get a rate of 3.15%, that's the cheapest, it is a variable rate with Haven, and the most expensive is 5.19%. That's a difference of over €300 Euro a month if you went with the worst as opposed to the cheapest. Oh so God. that's what you're looking at. Just quickly in terms of loans, if you were taking out a 20 grand loan, Revolut is the cheapest at the moment for personal loans, 5.99%. The most expensive is permanent TSB, just over 10%. That's a difference of €40 Euro a month that's around 500 euro a year and just think of how much we shop around to save like 50 euro on our car insurance you could be saving 50 euro a month oh on my your God. personal loan wow, so absolutely that. shop around that yeah, is absolutely. huge Let, listen and, and it, like think about your own household would you change your yeah. bank account if male, female? It is incredible to think it's that the men do a lot more. Also, I was talking to Dara about this. I've been with my fella for seven years. We still don't have a joint account. Like, still, I'm like, I've got my running away money and we're good to go. Yeah. Like, is that weird or are you kind of the same? 0896 111 you got to have your running away money. You can still have, you don't have to just have everything in the joint account. Anyway, Dara Cassidy, Consumer Advisor with Bonkers.ie. Great to have you with us. Thank you. He knows I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. <laughs> Alan, do you have your running away money? I've a, we have a joint account and we have our own accounts. Your own accounts. Yeah. So we you all, do we, have your money running away money. <laughs> well, I'm not running away after 28 years. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you never know. You never know, though. Listen, after the break, we're going to be discussing romance frauds and how to beat those lousy cheats we'll see in a few minutes. Welcome back. Now, from banking to the world of romance, romance. frauds. Uh, online romance fraud with a woman who has turned the table on scammers. Yes, author and romance fraud exposer Becky Holmes joins us now to discuss the effects scams have on their victims. Good morning to you, Becky. Thank you so Good morning, much. Morning, guys. For, thank you so much for joining us this morning. So, romance fraud, what is it and how did you become acquainted with it? So, um, romance fraud in the most basic terms, is somebody who uh, dupes you into believing that you're in a relationship and it's purely for their financial gain. Um, and in terms of how I became acquainted with it, I set up a Twitter account during lockdown because I was bored senseless. <laughs> and um, within days had this sort of handful of men, uh, impossibly good looking men, contacting me saying, hello, dear, hello, my <laughs> queen, how are you? And I was just deleting them and blocking them. And then after a while, I thought, oh, do you know what? I'm sick of this. I'm absolutely fed up with you. So I just thought, I wonder what I can say that will put you off. And I just started streams of ridiculous conversations to see what would happen and posted them on Twitter. And people really liked it and they found it funny. And um, But on the more serious side, I then started getting a lot of messages from people who had been a victim of romance fraud yeah. and needed somebody to talk to because a lot of people don't, you know, mention it to family or friends out of, you know, shame and embarrassment. Shame. They feel silly, yeah. Yeah, we've talked to people Absolutely. about this before and it is, you know, attacking and, you know, putting so much out mm. there and if you can just hook that one fish. But you kind of went on and I love, because <laughs> it's your Twitter, your Twitter and also your book now, Keanu Reeves is not in love with you because you found that an awful lot of these people were pretending to be celebrities like Keanu Reeves, Brad Pitt and even Elon Musk. That was one that I looked at on your Twitter recently. Like, yes. 
it, the celebrity ones um, amaze me and the Keanu Reeves ones are my favourite because he's famously not on any social media at all mm. um, and has no plans to be. And in fact, quite recently, his publicist came out and said, um, if you are contacted by, you know, an account under the name of Keanu Reeves, it's a scam. Um, but still it goes on. Because but, but, like, but the weird thing is, is that we know that people like Ben Affleck and James Franco and all this stuff, they have contacted people via their DMs. But like, we know on, that they, they have. They don't want to be in a re relationship do, with them. They, Becky, how... But they do it. They are have. people actually falling for this, that Keanu Reeves or someone like that is actually sending you messages and wants to have a relationship with you and asking you for money? They don't need money. No, the reason, the, the way that the um, the celebrity, the people pretending these celebrities do it, um, they don't say, you know, I, I need money because I'm poor, because of course nobody's going to believe that, you know. Um, but there are sort of several ways that they do it. So they will contact you and, you know, kind of have a sort of general chat with you. Um, and then they'll typically say that they would really like to meet you, but their management will only allow them to do it through a meet and greet program. Um, and there are different levels to this. So, for example, for five hundred dollars, you can, you know, have dinner. With this is it. So, um, I find it quite frustrating when people say, "Oh, you know, the, these people are stupid." They're, mm. you know, yeah. it, it, it's not the 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 thing that I mean. I've spoken to sort of thirty or forty romance fraud victims for the book, and not a single one of them was stupid. You know, I spoke to some incredibly clever people, but. The only thing they all had in common is that they're very kind. And, you know, they thought that they were in a relationship, a partnership with somebody, and they wanted to help them. So stupidity isn't the common thread. Kindness is the common thread. And it seems that as a society now, that's something that we treat with derision. It shouldn't be. It should be celebrated. And people should be not ashamed to come forward and say this has happened because it's not something that people fall for yeah. you know I, I'm I don't like that word it, it's something it's a crime that happens to somebody people don't fall for a burglary or fall for an assault we need to change the language um you know it, it's a crime that happens it's not something that people walk into and I think you know that would be a good start to help yeah. people overcome this embarrassment that's such a great uh, way of yeah. putting it yeah. in relation to the burglary uh, the Twitter and the book is out in uh, January 2024 it's available to pre-order now Keanu Reeves is not, not in, in love, love with, with you it. and it's got some amazing stories inside that uh, Becky Holmes thank you so much for joining us this morning you're welcome thanks a million fascinating, fascinating. fascinating. It really is. fascinating. Uh, lots more to come on Ireland AM we'll be back with you very shortly here in Daily Mount Park, the home of uh, Bohemians FC. That is Daniel. And in fact, that is the 46A, the bus that's going to be bringing out uh, the game for the big match this Friday. Shamrock Rovers take on Bose here uh, in Daily Mount Park. Live coverage on Virgin Media 2 from uh, 7.30 this Friday evening. We're going to be uh, previewing the match in and around 9.35 this morning. So that's all to come uh, later on this Thursday. Anyway, a quick look at weather. Uh, we're getting past 8 o'clock here together. Uh, some light showers still coming down here across the capital. In fact, the bulk of that rain mainly confined in across northern Leinster parts of the Midwest into southern sections of Connacht not escaping either but as for brighter spells uh, pulling through holding drier underneath that cloud cover as well in those uh, light to moderate west to northwesterly breezes now right across today in fact uh, those shards will clear off and in behind it in fact we have a decent day in store because that ridge of high pressure is building up across the country bringing with it some nice spring sunshine uh, through that cloud cover so it is improving as we edge away across the day, top tens of about 9 to 13, so slightly cooler than yesterday. And finally then tonight, mainly dry, calm, uh, clear and settled. Patchy mist and fog will develop to take us through tonight into tomorrow morning. Nice sunshine on the cards into your Friday as well, building into the Easter bank holiday weekend. But a cold night in store, sub-zero temperatures with values falling back to about minus one to plus five degrees. So that's how we're shaping up uh, for now. In Fizzra, Dublin 7, we'll be back again live at 8.35. For first-time drivers, young drivers, returning drivers, if you've had an open claim or have had too many penalty points. The quote devil's always got one hell of a quote. 
time now to take a look at this morning's papers. We'll start with the Irish Times. Its headline, Department failed to spend one billion earmarked for housing. Over the past three years, the government underspend could have built more than 4,000 affordable homes. 60,000 mortgage holders now trapped with vultures. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. Analysis shows that close to 60,000 are now described as mortgage prisoners. Nobody gave us eviction figures, is the top story on the Daily Mail. The Taoiseach has insisted the Cabinet was not presented with figures showing nearly 7,000 termination notices were pending before it made its decision to end the eviction ban, even though the analysis was sent to the Housing Minister's office. The Sun leads with Killer Dies in Blaze. A convicted killer and sex beast has died in a raging house fire in County Cork. The Star's front page, Killer on the Loose. Gardaí have launched a murder hunt for a runaway killer who stabbed a young woman to death in Limerick earlier this week. The Examiner leads with IFA chief dismisses Citizens' Assembly eco-levies. The country's main farming body has expressed serious concerns about the report of the Citizens' Assembly on biodiversity loss. The Herald's front page, Pistols at Thal. Armed Secret Service agents will have to stay behind a doorway two metres from US President Joe Biden as he addresses the houses of the Oireachtas next week because guns aren't allowed in the door. And finally, the mayor also leads with Joe Biden's visit. Its headline, Here Comes the Sun. The country is preparing to welcome a son of Ireland home when Joe Biden arrives next week. Leo Varadkar has said. Now, Miriam, you struck a chord with our viewers this morning. Miriam told us earlier on that herself and her better half... Yes. Uh, Me fella. <laughs> her fella. Me fella. ...don't have a joint account. They, and no intentions of getting one. And I thought it was very strange because I said myself and Carl have a joint account, but we also have our own account. Your separate account. Separate account. Joint account and separate account. And separate account. account. Yeah. Well. yeah, so and joint, joint account. account does the bills. Yeah, exactly. And separate accounts yeah. means you can you have your, have own. your runaway, runaway money. You're running away uh, money, as Murren was saying. But a lot of you have been getting in touch, and Emily said, being with my fella for seven years, we're getting married this year, and we still don't have a joint account. Hi, Emily. Hi. Uh, Eamon has said, you remind me of that my post office account still exists. I must check how much running away money <laughs> is in there after 20 years of interest. <laughs> on eight quid. On eight quid. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lou? Lou says, very much have my own account. Married triple one. Um, coming up next, journalist and mother of two, Geraldine Walsh offers advice to any new parents on trying to navigate parenthood. We all need that. We're back in a few minutes. Welcome back. Now, for some, motherhood is a confusing, overwhelming experience. And for many first-time moms, and we know that we've got an awful lot of first-time moms who watch, they can feel lost during this time of crazy hormones and crazy life changes. Uh, author Geraldine Walsh joins us now to talk about her experience. Geraldine, welcome to the show. Great to have you with us. Um, Great to have you, Geraldine. Let's talk about your experience, and you've written a book on it at the minute as well, but you, you talk about in your pregnancy, you had a difficult pregnancy. I had two difficult pregnancies. Two difficult yeah, pregnancies. Two, yeah. Did you feel, though, that once you got past, once the birth was done, then things were going to get a lot bit easier? But it didn't work out to be like that. Yeah, so I, so I suppose I had a lot of expectation about what motherhood would be like, um, and it didn't pan out that way at all. Um, on my first pregnancy, um, I had this, you know, belief that motherhood was sort of not easy, but you sort of get into it. You get into the flow of knowing what you're doing and you're feeling like very complete and this is, um, you're feeling very grateful for what you have. Mm -hmm. and, and yet when it happens, it's like a complete culture shock um, and life is not what you expect at all. And then on my second child, um, the pregnancy was even harder. And what sort of difficult was it? Hyperemesis or was uh, it? On the first pregnancy, I had a hyperemesis, oh. and on the second, I had um, a subchorionic hematoma. So I was bleeding at ten weeks, and I felt like I had to hold her in for the entire pregnancy. Oh, so oh my I, god! It was, and I didn't realize how intense of an experience that was until obviously the day she was born. When she was born, I had this incredible euphoria that uh, I'd never experienced before. I felt like this in, insane happiness. Um, which completely countered what happened afterwards because I was thrown into um, quite severe postnatal depression and anxiety, with the anxiety very much becoming a huge part of my life. I was having 30-plus panic attacks uh, and anxiety attacks a day. Um, I couldn't leave my house. I couldn't walk outside the front door. Um, 30 panic attacks? Uh, well, you're day. trying to care for a uh, newborn. Two, uh, three, three and a half year old and a newborn, yeah. Mm. Um, now, I think I was quite lucky in that um, two weeks postpartum, 
Um, once my husband went back to work, so he had two weeks off, um, which was that the comfort of having him at home was amazing. Yeah. And yet when he went back to work, um, I remember meeting up with my sister and her two children. And we went for a walk and um, I had this, that we had this, I had this experience of my child, uh, my three and a half year old, she was with her cousin and they were running out on what I felt they were running out onto the road. She wasn't, <laughs> she was perfectly safe. But I had uh, quite an intense reaction to that experience. And my sister immediately recognized and she said, hold on, Geraldine, I think there's, there's something up here. This isn't your normal behavior. Um, and I think if it wasn't for that, and also for my mum, who also recognized certain instances within myself um, uh, prior to giving birth, um, that both of them recognized that okay. there was something up. Okay. Um, so I was quite lucky that I got support and help quite early. Um, when you do give birth, though, and as, as you just mentioned, two really difficult pregnancies, mm -hmm. so all of a sudden, after the baby's there, you kind of think, right, but there's this expectation, isn't there, with motherhood and you just, oh, they'll know what to do, but it doesn't always happen like that and there's a real pressure and that obviously leads to that anxiety. Yeah, I, think, um, I think it's not necessarily that you struggle with how to feed your baby, how to get them to sleep, how to hold them, how to change their nappies. The, the, the physical side of having a child is, it, it happens um, and you get on with it, that kind of thing. But the, the real kind of conflict within motherhood is that you become a shell of yourself you 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 it, it, it like it's like it empties out all of your identity um you're so focused on family life on raising children on caring for a newborn which is an intensely exhausting and overwhelming experience mm. as it is that there's nothing left for you that you you become uh, the, one of the phrases I use um, within the books, I, 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 meant, I refer to myself as a ghost. I was just going from room to room within the house, doing, completing, um, managing the household, looking after the kids, um, and yet I was so transparent that no one saw what I did and I couldn't even see what I was doing on a daily basis. Um, so you lose so much of yourself in early motherhood. Mm. Um, and unless you're able to regain that, um, it carries on throughout your children's lives. It carries on until you're able to reassess what you actually want out of motherhood. That's, that's amazing to put it like that. You know, we've talked about it a lot of times, but to feel like a ghost, 0896 111 if this is resonating with you, because and, and, it's fascinating. You, you did something yourself to kind of get back to yourself. Yeah. Something um, like just physically. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, um, so after I had started counselling, um, I felt those conversations that I was having with my counsellor were very much um, helping me open the door to understand myself again. Yeah. So I think um, my second child, she was six months old at the time, um, and I decided I wanted to feel like me. I wanted to physically feel like me, so I got a buzz cut. I shaved my hair. I shaved all my hair off. I tattooed my whole arm, um, and my arm tells the story of my motherhood, so all of the tattoos that I have along my entire arm are literally the story of my children, my, my partner, my husband, and um, the experiences that I had with postnatal depression and anxiety. And wow. even though I was in it at the time, I still was getting the tattoos to, to because I felt like it was a, a very important part of my life as yeah. well. Um, because without, uh, I always say that without being a mother and without having the experience of postnatal depression and anxiety that I did have, I wouldn't be the person that I am today. Um, and they're, they're quite strong experiences and I probably wouldn't want to relive them again. Um, but at the same time, the experience of depression and anxiety really made me stronger. Yeah. Um, was, it, was it an expression? Yeah. Was it, like, it's hard to be open about maybe these struggles, mm. maybe to bar to a counsellor, to your family. So this was almost some way of you just opening, opening mm. up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so back then, um, so this was 2017, when I did, when I had my second child and, and shaved the head and, and got the tattoos and everything. And I was very much on social media, on Instagram quite a lot, where I was sharing my experience on a daily basis of, of, of anxiety. So I was sharing when I was literally in the middle of a panic attack, um, which in hindsight, I don't think benefited me in any way, but I did benefit other people who were having the same experiences and, and recognized in themselves what's something that I was expressing. But this brings up an interesting thing because we come from generations where it's like put up and shut up. Yeah. You know, women had hyperemesis for centuries, not yeah. a new thing, and yeah. they just had to Absolutely. get through it. Yeah. But there was also issues 
you know, with women being in, after children, extre severely depressed, but it was just ignored for centuries and centuries. And now we've got the social media where you're meant to be able to be everything that you are, but you are going to be attacked. Like we've just got, we've got a clip here for, from Molly May Haig. And as soon as she did this, my God, did her life change again. Let's take a quick look at her talking about motherhood. I've just been trying to talk and nothing is coming out. Like nothing, like I feel like what I'm saying isn't making sense. And I just feel like my brain is like, jumble like my brain is just like not my brain anymore and I just feel I just don't feel myself you know so that's Molly Mae just after she'd had the baby and she's like you just being like a ghost she's not herself anymore and she expressed that and she said that and of course oh my god this one is ungrateful like there's this dichotomy because you're expected to be everything it's like well, you're not real on social media and then when you are it's like the state of her yeah and I think there's there's such a huge vulnerability in, in early motherhood that you're feeling very raw and you're feeling very exposed and you don't, um, you don't feel yourself and you're feeling very lost. And yet when we try to express that, we're not given the nurture and care that we need. Mm. Um, how, how important was your partner? Oh, he still is. Like, I, mean, I, I, I still have generalized anxiety disorder, so I still have anxiety, but I have it under control as such. Um, so, you know, in the beginning, he didn't know what I was experiencing. Um, he didn't, he didn't actually physically see too many of the panic attacks because when he came home, he was my comfort. He was my, yeah. you know, he was my safe space. Um, and he also took over the, the role of being the, 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 the main parent. The, the care, yeah, yeah, he did so, it. Took it yeah. And so I was given that space to decompress from the day as such. Um, so I don't think it was probably for a year after I started having panic attacks and anxiety attacks that he saw one. Um, and it was probably quite a shock to him to experience, you know, witnessing that. I'd say it was frightening. frightening. Oh, very for frightening. Him. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely, you know, and yeah. to yeah. him being away from the house and not seeing really the yeah. the pressure that it's put on you. Listen, you wrote a book on it, fascinating book, Unraveling Motherhood. I was speaking to my wife about it, and she, listen, it was um, something that she's really looking forward to reading as well. Understanding yeah. your experience through self reflection, self care, and authenticity. Um, Jodie Watts, thank you so much you so for much. coming thank in and sharing you. your story. And Jodie yeah, talks about matriescence and the fourth trimester in it. Fascinating. It's really good. Thank you for taking the time to come in with us. Thank we'll you. be back with you on Ireland AM very shortly. You're such a messer. <laughs> Show them what you were doing. Tommy, Tommy had some pasta and you... <laughs> anyway. Anyway. <laughs> So if you're not um, putting the pasta on your eyes, comfort food <laughs> is something the Italians do so well. And it's no different this morning. We've got just the man. Alberto Rossi from Intercontinental Hotel is joining us. You're going to whip up a super tasty, kind of cheesy pasta dish. Exactly. So uh, first of all, good morning, Alan. Good, good morning, morning, Alberto. Good morning, Alberto. So, morning, Alberto. as it is Lent, usually people don't eat the heavy, they don't eat meat yeah. just before they come up to Easter. So what we do is like a baked, cannelloni pasta, and inside there is gorgonzola cheese, that it's a blue cheese. If you don't find the gorgonzola, you can use any other cheese. Blue cheese, I kind of like the cashew blue. Oh, yeah. Nice and powerful, blue, you know? yeah. And then you have the cannelloni. Cannelloni are very funny, you know, because you look at it as you're like, how can I eat this pasta? But you stop well, Tommy, Tommy immediately said, ah, oh, yeah. how can I use that for you gave binoculars? Me, you gave me a pack of these last time you did this. Yes, yeah, the still, packery I gave you, the half the ones, yes. Why? I tell you. Because I didn't know, because it was a sp sweet treat we did that day, I think, where I think I'll definitely give this one a go. Oh. All right, so it you're is. going to savory. Yeah. Exactly. And so, blue cheese, and, and it's easy enough. So what I have is, I have two or three things going. So let's start with the first thing. The first thing is the stuffing for the pasta, yep. okay? So in this case, it's blue cheese, ricotta cheese, widely available. Mm -hmm. There's a little, uh, there's one egg, how old? So both the yolk and the, and the white. And then Parmesan cheese and a little bit of pepper. So it looks quite loose, as you can see. There are little lumps of blue cheese. But that's okay. okay. Yeah, that is okay, yeah. you know? If you want to make it a little bit thicker, you can just add some Parmesan cheese, you know, and that will make it a little bit thicker. But, you know, you melt it anyway in the oven. So don't go crazy thinking, like, oh, it's not oh, big enough. Yeah. So that's going into the bag. Do you want me to put it into the bag? Yeah, why not, Tommy? Why you can not? go come here and give me a hand, you know? I'll you can you. hold the bag or you can hold that, you know? Okay. You, I'll hold you hold this. the bag, yeah. yeah. This is how it works this in the kitchen. Okay. You hold it like this. You put your hand on it, so you're... That's it. That's the professional way. Okay. Because it looks messy yeah. sometimes, Get you know? Get in the kitchen. No, don't worry. That's it. Look at that. So it's, it's fun, you know, because you can do it with the kids, you know? And I always say, if you have a family, usually 
dinner time can be a little bit stressful because you have to cook for yourself, then you have to cook for them, then you have to cook for somebody else. And so you do like this and you keep everybody entertained, okay? So what we do is then we cut the top of the piping bag, as you can see, okay? And then we start to fill the cannelloni. Okay, so it's long. See, the, Tommy wants to do this. I can actually <laughs> feel him here going, let me try, let me try, let me try. That's it. You know, I want you, to see how it's done first. You fill them up, okay? Then here I have bechamel, that it's flour, butter, and milk, okay? Very, you know, basic sauce that we do. And we put a little bit of it at the bottom so they won't burn. So have you filled So they that won't what? They won't burn. <laughs> burn. <laughs> You know, it's in the script every time I have to say burn, you know? Burn, baby, burn. Exactly. Yes. And you put it in, uh, and as you can see, I'm feeling one side and then the other side. Because if you try to be smart and feel it all on one side, oh, right. it'll pipe Come on, Tommy, you want, you're dying to give it a go. No, 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 this is Alberto's time to shine here. <laughs> you know? And it, it's, uh, as I was saying, it's good for Lent, you know? Because a lot of people eat fish, but some people don't eat fish. So you can put this cheesy, and if you don't like the blue cheese, you can do it with another cheese. But it has to be kind of melty. You can do it with brie. Oh, okay. Gorgeous, you can do it with yeah. brie. You know, if you find the blue brie, it's even better. The Bernays you know? sauce, sorry. So that's just the bechamel. Our bechamel, bechamel. sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, flour. Flour butter. and butter. So you take your so butter. Just, you okay. take your butter and you put it in the pan. Yeah. And it starts to melt. Then yeah. you add your flour at the same time. Just a little bit. Yeah. It usually is the same amount of uh, grams. So you put four, uh, 35 grams of flour, 35 grams of butter, and half a liter of milk. And then you oh, get the right God. consistency. Because with the bechamel, it's all about the consistency. And, and that goes over it now. And that well. goes over it now, like this. Okay. So you cover it, because this is what's going to cook the cannelloni pasta. You know, it's like, it's like making a lasagna, oh, but course. instead of doing yeah. sheets of pasta, you're doing... And do you say what? <laughs> <laughs> See how I did the enunciation correctly, no? What are they? See? Sheets. Of pasta. Of pasta. <laughs> <laughs> and then you put Parmesan cheese on top. I oh, see, that was, I, I made a spaghetti bolognese last night, but I forgot the Parmesan cheese. Oh, yeah. Oh, but that's no good then. That's, that's, yeah, you know? that's no good. Uh, you know, the Parmesan is what makes a lot of these flavors, know, you know? Oh, I know, I forgot it. And then we put it in the oven, okay? The oven. In the snow. oven, that's it. You know, it's going to be about 20 minutes at about uh, 175, 180 oh, grams. look at this. And, and then this is what comes out, OK? OK. Now, obviously, I made a bigger one because people are hungrier, you know, so... Wow. You know? That. And you see, it's nice and crusty at the top, and the pasta now is fully cooked because it's been in the oven long and enough. So show us this, what you have here as well. So here I have Romanesco broccoli that comes like this. Look at that. Right? I'd, never, we'd, I'd never seen this before. It's the same family, so it's the brassica family. Broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage and all that. Uh, this is a mix between a uh, cauliflower and a broccoli, so it has the same consistency of the broccoli, so quite thick, okay. while the broccoli can be a little bit loose and yeah. flowery. Uh -huh. But you're not cooking it. I cooked it. I only oh, blanched you it quickly. You blanched that I one. just blanched it quickly. You can even leave it, if you shave it very nicely, you know, you can still use it like that. So you're going to put this over that? Yes, I'm going to now prepare. Okay. I'm going to do prepare a little bed of Parmesan cheese, as I like to do for every pasta, you know, why not? Oh, do why you do that? that? Do why not? Because it looks good, you know? It looks good. You know? And then yeah, we're gonna... Italian food just has to have Parmesan, doesn't it? It just seems to be... See, then so you just important. break it up. You know, it doesn't have to be pretty, OK? Because it's a big pasta. Yeah. Yeah. OK? And then you see, it's all broken. <laughs> <laughs> Very just, unpretty. Just uh, as you said, it doesn't have you know? to be pretty. And that's it, you know, one year. And then you needed a bigger spoon, there. Alberto. I did, but I didn't prepare it, you know? So now <laughs> I'm in trouble. So then you have to... Uh, try to now, do there's what no you sugar in this, so can no you No sugar have this? at all. Mary can eat this. There's no sugar. And then okay. you put a little bit of pistachios on top. Okay, so you have the crunch, because otherwise it's all loose, it's all melty. Yeah, yeah. You know? and, and then, then a couple of the Romanesco so you broccoli. Just eat them, oh, you blanch them, so I they're not cold. Them. Exactly, they're not cold, but they're probably room temperature now. Look, they look cool, though, don't but they? But that's it, you know? And it, it looks very different. Very and you have a little bit of texture no. while you're biting in there. There we go. Very it's key nice. when you're eating. Okay. And would you put a little bit of bechamel or anything over it? Like, so, no, if you plenty. have any left, you it's can got, put it over, you know? But you wouldn't... Uh, well, I suppose it is cooked, isn't it? Yeah, it is cooked. It's probably very hot, is it? I say it will be hot. Yeah. You know, maybe not scaldy, but I would say it's good. Mm, yummy. And it's certainly not burnt. Mm. It's not burnt, not it's this not time. Burnt, no. mm. It's not burnt, It's not burnt, we're only going to have some. Yeah. Alberto Rossi from the Intercontinental Hotel, thank you so much for no that. No problem at all. Delicious. Very well. It's not burnt. <laughs>
Merlin, it's not burn. You can, you feel there's the no burn. sheets in it. No sheets. <laughs> there's no sheets. <laughs> no sheets. No sheets um, here, no. No, no, no sheets not yet. either. Phil not is yet. here today, no, and I'm like, have you had Alberto's food yet? He's no, but I've watched it. So you I've get to have Alberto's food. And then you can talk about what we can do with all of these eggs. Yeah, lots of stuff. And like really simple fun that you can go miles away with. There's really cool stuff here. And also it's either we're, we're throwing a, um, a coin to see who's going to stand on a bunch of eggs. It's me or Tommy. Don't know. We don't know. One of us will stand what? on a bunch of eggs. So we'll be back with be you. Tommy. We'll be back with you in just <laughs> a few minutes. Tommy. We've got to get on a weighing scales to find out who can do it. We'll talk to you in a second with some science. Gonna want to try this. Love it. Want to try your hand at some exciting egg sighting? Egg, yeah, science experiments <laughs> this Easter. He's been saying it all day. Scientist Phil Smith is here with everything. You need to have fun over at the break. This yes. is good crack. Yeah, fair. Oh. oh, you're not the only one. Yeah. Okay, so what are we going to do? We get them all out of our system like mad yolk, all the ones now. Uh, <laughs> so what this are we is simple to... fun is what this is. Brilliant. It is actually, we've yeah, been just... having lots of fun with this. So let's do the first one. Great. So the first one is, is this, like it's balancing oh. an egg up like upside down. So if you try to do this on your own and get it to sti sit, it won't, obviously. So this okay. looks magical in some ways. Uh, but what it is is also if you just get a little bit of salt, Okay. Put it on the table, and then when you put, you do is you balance the egg in the salt essentially, because sort of salt is granular, won't run away. It holds it in place. You then blow it away, and the egg will stay. So it's balancing what? on like four. Like you could obviously thanks, thanks Tommy. There you go. He's Just get it that side for you. Well, um, why? Why? Why um, does it do that? Okay. So salt is like cube shaped. So it doesn't want to roll away anywhere. So when you've got a few, and because the top of the egg is so small, it only needs to sit on a few of those types of grains. Now, this is really quick and really, really simple. Other side, other way. Well, either way, either way will work. Oh, is it? Yeah, no, it'll work either way. Now, the thing about this is, though, like, you could do this really quick with your kids and then be out and done. Or you could go, will this work with sugar? Or will it work with something else? Yes. Or And let them spend an hour or two. To, oh, okay, nice. brilliant. That's a good oh, no. <laughs> Okay, so it is doable. Yes, not achievement just unlocked. There you go. Congratulations. So okay. grand, it won't work with sugar. Well, or will it? It might do. See, this is the thing. And it's, it's about kids experimenting, trying things and figuring stuff out. And they may be writing and something balancing. down. Balancing. It's so clever. It's all this to of learning. stuff in this that is really, really simple. Next one. What next else one. we got? Okay, next one. Again, this is one, is one that you can, it takes a couple of days. So these are, like, you can either call these alien eggs or weird slimy eggs. So these are normal eggs that I left in a glass of vinegar, just normal malt vinegar. And if you'd let them and then let them go. They're eggs. Yeah, the eggs. So it's just the, so it dissolves the, the shell. So or the something, vinegar dissolves the shell. <gasps> <gasps> so if you drop it a little too much, it will fall. <laughs> You'll see. Thanks, Tommy. That was not planned. Oh, that man. was not planned. You'll see the. Sh so that is essentially the membrane. That's of what's the membrane. Left Alan, could you make an a trip? Thank you very much. Oh, oh, so sorry, Phil, because I was actually asking you this you earlier. Did. I said, don't do it too hard. Yes. Yeah. Yes, again. But, uh, but it's experimentation. Me, you told me it was like cooked all the way through, but it's not. No, I didn't. Not, so I never said it was cooked all the it, way through. You said that. Yeah. So <laughs> it's just a shell, right? That's true. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, there you go. Don't there. bash it too hard. Don't bash kids. it too hard. Yeah. But <laughs> this is, we're, we're nailing this. It's great. So if you just drop it a little bit, <laughs> yeah. it'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. That is, I, 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 if you're not like a rugby you player, it lashing it off. Okay. You do like, like it like a line out. Like, it'll be perfect. Okay. <laughs> you're just you're reverting to type. That's okay. what happens. That's okay. but and look are, how pretty it is if it's on your pan. Let's, let's do something crack else. that into the frying pan. You perfect. Can't. But it'll be a vinegary yeah. flavor, not okay. necessarily. Okay. Well, we're going to try something else. We're going to use atmospheric pressure. This one, it's a little bit different. Uh, it, we have a bottle. You've one there as well. You can try to do this together if you want. If you have a, an or egg you and you this. sit it on top, it won't go in. Hard-boiled egg. Hard-boiled egg. It'll sit in. It won't go in. because yep. Now, you can try... If to get it inside the bottle, you could smush in if you yes. wanted. Uh -huh. But there is a trick that if you use atmospheric pressure... So if you put... There's two candles there. If you put the two candles inside it like that, and then we light these. What we're going to do, they're obviously this heat being given off by these. Yeah. So I can do, I can just want to tilt there. So normal birthday candles. They're lit. If you're doing this, this is parental control parental on now, this one. So yeah. then if you take the bottle and then if you put it over on top and just let it sit and kind of create a seal <gasps> with it, the eggs will go out and then Look at that. pop in. Oh! 
That was amazing. So it's atmosphere. So the outside we've got atmospheric. I'm an old woman. My eggs are breaking. <laughs> <laughs> ah, you're a wench. On you're running out of now, eggs. The snazzier trick though is, is then how do you get, how to, get, to, get it out? Yes. So you pressure outside pushed it in. Yeah. So if we increase the pressure on the inside to get it out, so what might work is that if I blow inside it and then create pressure oh. on the inside. Oh. <gasps> Put egg on your face. Oh, Mind oh, blow. That is very cool. Oh, it's good, isn't it? That I is very such cool. I am I love this. Stuff. But that is so cool. I but that's like a stuff. bottle and eggs, and you can, like I said, you can create hours with that. Like I mean, now just make sure you lube your eggs a little bit before a little bit of water or oil on the outside. Okay. <laughs> good to know. Just good to know. Edge. Good just to know. Random thing. Uh, okay. Last finally, thing. final thing. Did okay. you ever think that you'd hear something like that? <laughs> okay. So. Eggs are phenomenal, and they're engineering masterpieces over evolution. Okay, so an egg, have you know what an arch and a bridge yes. is shaped like that? You've got the cornerstone, you put pressure on the top, and it spreads the weight over the whole edge. Yeah. Okay. A dome shape is like an arch, an arch, an arch, and all the yeah. way around. So if you take an egg and try and put it in your finger and crush it down like that, not as hard as you can, but try it. Tommy will break no, it. I, no, no, I'm not try, even going to try it. Trust it and see how far you get. Tommy like, will see, break it. There you go, Tommy. Okay, yeah. yeah. There you go. <laughs> okay, so, so it's really, really strong in one direction. Yeah. If you, do it that way and try to it'll, it'll break, break into. So this is why hens are able to sit on top of eggs, but yet baby chicks are still able to go because they tap in the opposite direction. Oh. So what oh. we're going to try to do is to so about you get about five and a half pounds, a few kilos on top of an egg. Okay. So what we're going to try to do, because it's gone so well so far already, is we have a set of two, uh, two, two dozen eggs. And so gonna... I'm ten stones. That's what 140 pounds. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So how we're many do we have here? Stand on this. Pounds. I know. What's kilos? Oh, yeah. kilos. Divide kilos. 140 so pounds by 2.2. So okay. the idea is that you're, now because you're using lots of eggs. So if you just use it, and so put one foot on the right. Now flat shoes because it's spread out over the few of the eggs. Yeah. And then try and put your foot on the other one. Put oh, your weight shit, on. Oh, there's a crack. Stop. No. Oh. Put my foot in the other Come one. Come on, go on, Quick. trust it. And there you go. Oh, and then oh, one, one side is, one side okay. okay. And now try and stand back off and we'll see. We'll see, we shall see. Yeah, you might have cracked one or two. I've cracked okay, two no, eggs. Cracked. So the reason for this, so that side, no cracking at all. These are all perfectly fine. So the first one you put all your weight on was ground, but that one, because you angled your foot, you Oh, I didn't put it on flat. flat. So this is it. Oh, so I did, I put the pressure on this one. But you could do this and have kids stand on stuff or get them even to crush in different ways or maybe drop stuff and create this. But hours of fun. Love it. just eggs. This is literally all Easter holidays is going to keep the kids happy. And hours of fun. Well, and let's keep Tommy entertained. And if not the kids, me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> Phil Smith, love it. This is very cool. You're welcome. This that, is very that, cool. That uh, sucking into the bottle. Absolutely. Well, you do. Are you doing an experiment? You're doing it on like people can see your stuff online, can't you? Oh yeah, we go. I'm, you'll find me somewhere or Instagram. You find me, Phil of Science. Get your Phil of Science. Phil of, Phil science. of science. There you go. Thank you so much. You're so good to have you in. Uh, we've loads more still to come, including Brian Lloyd's going to be reviewing lots of great movies and lots, lots more. We'll see you back after this short break. Come on. <laughs> Everybody else is confused as we are right now. <laughs> My kids, if they're watching this, they love it. this song. It's hey, a come on, Barbie, let's go party. Is anybody else excited for the new Barbie movie? Yes. No. Oh, what? <laughs> um, oh my God, I cannot the wait. The trailer came out yesterday with Ryan Gosling, Margot Robbie. Everyone, everyone Nicola Cochran, everyone is in Nicola Cochran. Oh, yeah. in it. Yeah. That was a surprise. Nobody was talking about her. And then there she is. Will Ferrell as well. Will Ferrell, he Helen right Mirren. In. We could go on forever. Like, it's amazing. The posters have become a sensation on social media and our social team have kindly given us our own ones and everyone's given us that so That's me. Okay. That's, that's me. Do you not see like when I get out of here? That's Karen Costner. When I get out of here, yeah. Who is that? That's Karen. So that's what they're doing. This is Barbie. So do we have another picture there? <laughs> Who else do we got? Oh, oh there's Ken. Ken. These Ken are the real Ryan. ones. That's Ryan okay. Gosling. Yeah, Ken. Ken. Now let's see if we can see the next one. Oh, look who it is. This is Ken. Don't see another Ken. The Ken guy from, from goes on holidays. I'm trying to read these now. There, oh, there she is, Barbie herself. Uh, always on her phone. Always on her phone. I'm more oh, just right, being okay. bossy, am not I? Right. And what's the next one? Oh, there he is. This Look is it. Ken. There's the Ken. guy with ten siblings. The guy oh. with ten siblings, all in this <laughs> pink. Great. You did a shoot special for Barbie. Really yeah. Cracked that joke. <laughs> Practice. Uh, very good. I'm sure uh, it's taken the world by sensation. Well done. I'm sure you've done team. it as well, probably as well. Thank we you. We are Thank going you. to be chatting all things Barbie a little bit later, plus the latest film releases, including one animation 
That's going to bring back a lot of nostalgia. Mm. Super Mario Brothers, Brian Lloyd is going to be joining us to talk us through it. Brian, um, Chris good. Pratt. Yeah, good, yeah, really good. Yeah, I mean, Chris Pratt was getting a bit of stick for his voice acting, but he's actually pretty good in it, I thought. Not the worst thing about it. Um, Charlie, <laughs> that's a bit bad, I don't know why. But yeah, we're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about Air, which is the new biopic about how uh, Nike signed Michael Jordan. And I'm going to be talking about the new Guy Ritchie film that's on Amazon Prime. So, um, what's the talk of it? Okay. Yeah, I okay. was looking forward to that, and then I read your review. Yeah, okay, we'll be good. chatting to that about that in just a little while, from Prince Harry to Will Smith. We sit down with the New York comedians dissecting the juiciest celebrity memoirs so you don't have to read That's them. That's handy, isn't it? It's very handy. Now from Messi to Mbappe. <laughs> See, I know these people. Uh, Derek's out, out to steal the show this morning. How's the training going, Derek? Yes, Al, I'll tell you, we've got pitch side seats here uh, for the Dublin Derby that's kicking off tomorrow night. Uh, Bose FC taking on Shamrock Rovers. Uh, Pat Fenn, the, the lead on Messi of Irish football. <laughs> <laughs> Pat, what are the chances tomorrow night for Bose? Yeah, I think we're confident we're in a good position at the moment. We're playing quite well. Obviously, Rovers had a good win last week, so it makes for a very interesting Ah, uh, Get out of it, he's biased. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we'll catch up with Pat and uh, Graham Gartland in around 9.35 uh, later on this morning. Guys, did I see a Barbie poster with my face on it? Chaotic Ken. Yes. Uh, <laughs> doing the rounds on social, ah, here. Your one was perfect. He <laughs> is our Chaotic Ken. He is, absolutely. We love him so much, and Karen yeah. Coster's one was amazing as well. It's just but gone... she is the Barbie. She's the Barbie. Thanks for staying with us. Now, uh, we're getting loads of reaction from you at home this morning on something that Mirren said earlier on. What did you say, He's so Mirren? shocked. Why is anyone no, listening to her? It's that. awful. Um, just <laughs> that um, myself and my partner, my lovely fella... Fiancé. We, my fiancé, there we go. Soon we do, married. We Very don't exciting. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm the half boss. Oh, um, yeah. We don't have is, we don't have a soon. joint account, right? You know we don't have any kids. Uh, so it's been it works out fine. It's all good. Lorna so says. So where where does the money come out of? Who pays the bills? Oh, I, no, let's not get into I that. I have a direct debit that goes into his account and then he pays the bills. So he pays the bills. Right, because you See, need we, to have that. Now, like, I took over some hard. of the bills recently because we went shopping around. So I put well, them in my uh -huh. name and it was all that kind right. of stuff. And myself and Tommy have a joint account, but we also have our own personal yes. account. Yes, there we go. And Miriam was calling it her running away running money. Running away money. To keep your own account. And I thought most people who are in relationships around the country or married would have a joint account. Not no. so, seemingly. Lorna says, we've been together 25 years and we're married 16 with two children. Never had a joint account. When we did our pre-marriage course, the only thing your man could pick out to tell us that we should do <laughs> better was get a joint account. We never bothered. It works, Grant. There's a lot of paperwork. It's, it's easier to get the old marriage licence Why sometimes. would you not set up a joint account? I don't get... What's the hassle with it? I have a, well, now, let's... No, James yeah, makes a good James, point. James makes a very good yes. point there, and I think this is something we should do on the show. Just a thought, if one of the two partners dies, their account goes into probate, mm. and then the estate of the deceased is tied up possibly for years. And we were chatting about that here. If you're and, not married. If you're not married. But then I'm, I'm assuming if you have a will that leaves it to the other person, that's fine. But there's a whole grey area yeah. there that maybe we should discuss on the show. Yeah. And the way is the laws yeah. are so archaic in Ireland, yeah. you'd, you'd imagine probate. that they just expect if you get married, you'll have a joint account where actually and there's probably loopholes and, and... and messes around yeah. with kids and stuff. Exactly, yeah. Um, Definitely yeah, something that I that. think we're well, going to talk about on the show. We will, because we have such jolly shows. Let's talk about death and probate. <laughs> no, but it's coming it's your way. Know. 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 Lots of people might know that they're in that situation, and if their partner yeah. dies, that they they could be unexpected death. Unexpected, as well. yeah. absolutely. Um, you know, and also a huge situation. thank you uh, to everyone who got in contact off the back of chatting Geraldine. to Geraldine Walsh about her book, Unraveling Motherhood, about how she felt. So many people it resonated with them, going, "I didn't know who I was," huge. and when she said that she felt like she was a ghost walking around her house, loving her children, but didn't know who she was. Just loss of identity. Thank yeah. you so exactly. much for those messages. We really do appreciate it and we will talk about it again without a shadow of a doubt. Definitely. Now, uh, after the break, Maureen is so looking forward to this. I We're know. going to be judging the juiciest celeb autobiographies with the comedians behind the popular podcast Celebrity Memoir Book Club. We'll see you in a few minutes.
You're very welcome back. Now, our next guest took their love of celebrity gossip and trivia and turned it into a popular podcast. I'm just joking, talking because he was asking them where they're staying. It's all I've heard about that hotel. Is it I nice? did. I did hear about it. It's new. <laughs> he can't get away. He's the hotel king. It's as simple <laughs> as that. Uh, we're joined now by the comedians behind the podcast, Celebrity Memoir Book Club, Ashley Hamilton, Ham Hamilton and Claire Parker. Good morning. Good How morning, are you? Morning. We're great. Thanks We've for got us. Americans in the studio. So straight into Trump. No, we're joking. Um, <laughs> God, they're, just went, just, oh God, no. they're like we've just gotten away from that. We yeah. live in New York. Um, Claire, tell yeah. for anyone who might tell us, what, kind of the name is in the thing. Tell us about Celebrity Memoir Book Club and where the idea came from. So Celebrity Memoir Book Club, reread the book so that you don't have to. Basically, every single week we read a different celebrity memoir. We will give you the full rundown in like an hour, hour and a half. So you don't have to read it. We give you all the juicy parts. And then we are comedians. We do think we're funny. We will give our opinions because sometimes they're not reliable narrators. You can't trust the celebrity to tell you what they actually think and believe. So you kind of have to get in between the lines and be like, what really happened here? And we will do that for you. Now, Thank can you. I just say, I understood about a quarter of that. <laughs> Only joking. <laughs> but you have got some criticism about your accents and the, the way the banter between you. Because it's it, like, it is, it's quick, it's, it's fiery, it's New yeah. York. It's quick and people will often chime in and be like, why do we have to hear your opinion? And I, we'll say, because you turned on our podcast. Um, <laughs> why do we have to hear it from your voice? And I say, well, because you you turned on the one that we're telling you. Yeah. So <laughs> We don't get a lot of hate for the accent because where we're from, we sound very normal. But we do get a lot of hate for the... What is it? The verbal fry. The vocal and the fry. And we just say, What's if you don't, verbal fry? Or vocal, vocal fry. fry. It's the Kardashian. The Kardashian. Oh, okay. Yes. When you do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We can't help it. We were born this way. And if you don't like it, don't we, listen. Find a man to read it to you. I yeah. There's an audio book. Buy the book. I don't like the audio book. Because it is. Uh, it is it is an interesting thing. When I first started listening to you, you go for it at the start to be like, you do not have to listen to this. Yeah. Stop it. Well, because people will always say like, why should I care about your opinion? And I, I say, so you, you don't, don't have to care. Yeah. It's funny to listen to the podcast. I'm like, you could truly buy the book yourself. If you yeah. don't like the way we do it, do it yourself. Go learn what Mel B thinks on your own. Okay, let's talk. Because there is, when I listen to this, I was, uh, ye have made me bought by autobiographies because I've oh, listened wow. to the podcast and gone and Mel B was the first one that I was like I have to I have to read this book actually there's some really dark stuff like it's not just having the crack Mel B's book was so searing when you read some of these are you kind of shocked at how deep it can go yeah and I would say we never I never guess the right ones sometimes we'll pick up a memoir and I'll be like this one is going to go deep and then it'll just be a, a book about what's in their purse mm -hmm. and then <laughs> I'll pick up a Mel B and I'll be like oh Spice Girls this will be fun and all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, I've learned so much about her. I've learned about myself. I've grown as a person. <laughs> That's the thing. They're shocked. They're like, oh my God. And then you discuss that in the podcast yeah. between yeah. yourselves. And you will still say, I wasn't expecting that from her and, and different things mm. like that. What about Prince Harry? Prince Harry, I have to say, the shock of the lifetime was finding out that was all about flying a helicopter in war. You're like, I came here for the gossip of the royal family. Why won't you stop talking about Afghanistan? <laughs> I will say, if you've ever wanted to learn how to fly a helicopter, he essentially transcribes the manual. In, in his, I mean, it's like the full third of it, and you're like, okay, and now we're shooting, and now we're flying, and now we're in the desert again, and you're like, okay, we're getting back to Kensington. It's <laughs> yeah. a 400-page book with 150 pages about flying a helicopter, and it's you're just like, rain. okay. <laughs> This is a lot of helicopters. So you don't have See, to read the book now. Now, I don't have, now I'm not going to bother to buy the book or read it. Yeah. Is there an issue though, Claire? Because I know that some people are now sending you the book so that you will dissect them. You yes. know, it's yeah. happened with Viola, like, and you know, you've done Viola Davis, which was just fa fascinating. Um, but is there is there other people going, oh, these people, I'm not making money now. They're not going to buy my book because they can just listen to it on this podcast. Um, you know, I think... We're not getting a ton from press. I think I think press is good press for these people. The only person who wouldn't send it is Prince Harry. He was kind of stingy with it. And Paris Hilton Paris was a bit, Hilton was was a bit tough difficult. to get. But for the most part, I think people feel like you. If we give you a good review, you're going to want to go out and read it yourself. Absolutely. And if you yeah. didn't write a good book, then that's kind of your fault. We had <laughs> one celebrity DM us and be like, will you please read my book? I'm so excited. And we never heard from her again. We reviewed it and we gave it like a 4 out of 10. And... The DM Who was stopped. it? Who was it? Heather Gay from Real Housewives of uh, Salt Lake City. Oh, yeah. yeah, that was a good episode. Thank yes, you, so you hated the book. <laughs> good episode, bad book. <laughs> bad book. Bad book. Bad book. When you get a bad book, is it nice? Is it cathartic to to kind of 
Go a little. Sometimes I don't mind. you didn't like Ellen DeGeneres at all. Oh God, that one is not nice. Ones like that where you're just like, okay, why did you even write this? This is a, this could have been written by anybody. It's about nothing. Those ones I'm like, okay, stop. But well, what, what did she write about then? So that was a bathroom book, and I think that's the fault of the publisher for categorizing it as a memoir. Because if you hear the word memoir, you're assuming childhood trauma, yeah, self reflection, insights. Gossip, but something. that's not what she no, was her doing. No, she's like, like when here's I, what I think about tweezers. Have you ever <laughs> noticed? And you're like, I haven't noticed because I don't care, Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> and tell us about Alec Baldwin and Matthew McConaughey then. They were also two oh that you God. had going, I, I mean, don't like these. They're, first of all, a thing that we've noticed about memoirs written by men, no offense, is <laughs> you guys don't know what's important. Um, there are a lot of details and they'll be like, well, because I'm a star, people want to know every single thing that's ever happened to me. And you're like, well, that's simply not true. And they really <laughs> have a hard time parsing out like the important details from the real details, even what actually happened. There are parts of Matthew McConaughey's book, he, he talks about his dreams, first of all, like dreams he had. And then there are other moments in the book where you're like, this may have been a dream, actually. <laughs> I can't fathom that this actually happened to you. I think you're explaining another dream and you forgot. <laughs> I do have to disclose, we made fun of Matthew McConaughey's book to the nines, and I it did inspire me to quit my job. It that, changed her entire life. It changed life. my life, but it was goofy. It was a silly, silly book of bumper stickers, mostly, but it did uh, get Why did it inspire you to, lo to leave your job? Well, you know, I was at the catchphrases. His catchphrases, and some of them are undeniable. Like, one of them was, if you're unhappy in your life, just turn the page. And I was like, yeah. Well, <laughs> turn the what is that, wrong? No, it totally no, So great. I quit my job, and I banked on this, and it worked out. Look and it that. did work out. Three Matthew Ireland. McConaughey. This <laughs> is why he wants to be president <laughs> or governor of Texas. He's, I mean, he's made my life better. I can only imagine he'll do the the same for America. What's he going to do? Oh my God, gun. you can't get worse than Trump, so let's, let's <laughs> yeah, leave it at that. Here. <laughs> There's, because obviously, you do memoir from all around the English-speaking world, yeah. shall we say. Yeah. So when you get into <clears> stuff like Love Island with Molly Mae Haig, um, as we mentioned, the Spice Girls, you've done a lot of Spice Girls books. Um, you've Lily Allen's, like, you love that. There's the cultural differences, because obviously, we would know an awful lot about American culture, because we've been brought up on... Back for that. <laughs> but that's when you realise you have so many people in Ireland who are listening to your podcast. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, what's up? Uh, we have to, even if we don't know the name of somebody's own sister, I feel like we have to stick with it and just read our best. You, you barreled through the names. <laughs> yeah. Like what? Like Roisin, Grogne. Roisin is Mourin. a big one. Roisin. Let's not even go Mourin. there. Um, was Roisin one that you just couldn't get? I will say the Mourin. problem what? is not even that we think we can't get it. It's just that we see it on the page, we say it out loud, and we go, that must be it. And then we get notes later saying, What did you think Roisin was? I think we said Roisin. Roisin. <laughs> Roisin. <laughs> and <laughs> Egypt was a big one. Oh, oh, yeah, Egypt. I couldn't have... I was like, oh, a, a different way to spell idiot. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's say, people were like, that's a completely different word that just means the same thing. And I'm like, okay, it's, it's the same word. It means the same thing. It means idiot. <laughs> that's what it is. Even though you got an Irish word tattooed on your ankle. Yeah, I got that last time I was here. You got there gold. You, go. ta you got cool to tattooed on your ankle. Yeah, I went to a, um, a Dublin game at yeah. Coke Park. And then I saw it on the... And I always... I don't, I feel like my friends always make fun of me for just being like, cool. And so I saw it on the scoreboard and I thought, that's really fun. And then someone told me that in French it means but. And I was like, well, what a multifaceted word. word spell. The, it's a perfect thing that I should have on my body forever. So we're going to talk about, you're here in Dublin because you have a show in uh, Liberty Hall Theatre tonight and the Sugar Club tomorrow. So it's basically, you've been entertaining us here for like 10 minutes. So is that what it's going to be like? Just use chatting about all these celebs and books that you have reviewed. We try to make it like the podcast, but better for live. So we, we're both stand-up comedians. We do a little bit of stand-up. We do a small essay so it's like you get the experience of the podcast but in a shortened quick version we're gonna go right through it and then we play a lot of games where we do callbacks to old memoirists we take hot takes from the audience and we respond it's a lot of just like banter like off the cuff talking about the people we all know it's really fun people have a lot of, and they're always different so if you went to both shows you would get a different show both times oh lovely because i was saying they should be doing the bible on good friday yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> jesus had jesus had a ghost a review ghost could you writers imagine for the that review one. on that one oh my <laughs> god <laughs> people would love that one um so you're going to be in liberty hall and that is tonight in <clears throat> dublin and the sugar club in dublin tomorrow that 
that is the 7th of April. Good Friday, you'll have an absolute ball. Uh, Claire Parker and Ashley Hamilton, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We're going football crazy ahead of Bohemians versus Shamrock Rovers game, which is airing tonight. I can't wait. It's on Virgin Media tomorrow. 2. Is it tonight? Tomorrow, tomorrow night. night. It says tonight. It says tomorrow night. Did it say tomorrow night? That's how excited I was. <laughs> What's it to be now? Well, listen, it's on tomorrow night. I want it to be tonight, but it's absolutely. tomorrow night. Well, we couldn't have sent anybody better, apart from Alan, to Daily Man Park. Derek, our roving reporter, he's got the boots and all ready to go. Derek, take it away. Absolutely, Al, it's tomorrow night, 7.30 Virgin Media 2. Anyway, guys, welcome back down here to uh, Daily Mount Park. We're here to preview that all Dublin header of Shamrock Rovers take on Bowes at 7.30, as we mentioned, on Virgin Media 2. First time ever as well, a League of Ireland game shown uh, across broadcast across the station. Here with us this morning, Grant Gartland, uh, former League of Ireland player and Virgin Media commentator, as well as Pat Fennan, uh, former player, uh, coach and now director of football here with uh, Bowes. Will you ever run for president someday, Pat, will you? For Bowes, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll start off with uh, you, Graeme. This is a sold-out game. Yeah, and rightly so. I think we, me and Pat were talking before, if there was a bigger capacity, I think you'd get a lot more people in as well. I think you could easily put 15,000 in here tomorrow night. Yeah, we're up to 5,000 here in the stadium, aren't we? 450 Rovers fans, they're getting 7,000 in Tala. Like, you know, you could easily bring 5,000 Rovers fans here tomorrow night this, this is going to be a cracking atmosphere and a great game Now let's talk about uh, the teams themselves uh, Bowes are top their first uh, Shamrock over sixth down the table a little bit Yeah they got their first win against Dundalk a, f- a comprehensive 4-0 win and that's them up and running they've been playing well the performance has been good they probably just haven't got the results maybe the performance has deserved uh, they had a few disciplinary issues with these seems to have sorted out but Bowes are obviously flying high they've won 6 out of 7 games and they're 10 points clear so it makes for a uh, Cracking game uh, a cracking game. The transfer window uh, closed there a couple of weeks ago, and they strengthen up the back line as well for both. Yes, yeah, they have. We were just talking about it there. They brought in like a whole new back four, really. Uh, I know Grant Horton been here before, but the two centre backs, and then they brought back Paddy Kirk, who, who's been an excellent signing for them. He scored a great goal here against UCD, uh, and that's given them a platform to allow their that front players, which Ali Coote would be one, Afalab, he's been excellent as well. So, um, again, Bowes are in form, but you're, you're up against the three-time champions here. They've won the league the last three years in a row, and it's a different animal. And these games, form can go out the window. Um, so it's about who performs on the night. Uh, on the night. Now, Pat, you have this uh, beautiful relationship with Bowes because he keep coming back. <laughs> yeah, I've been back a few times now. It's been back as a player, obviously here as a player and as a manager, and now back as a director of football. So, and they've all been good times, they've all been successful times, so hopefully this tour time back will bring us a bit of success. But listen, the club's in a different place to where it was previously. It's 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 grown massively, you know, uh, off the pitch. It's been a fantastic turnaround. Um, and on the pitch, we start the season really well, which is brilliant because it gives everybody confidence. The place is full every week, no matter who we're playing, the place is packed out. So it's it's a great club to be around at now, the moment. Now, you were four years in Linfield, I see you did a cracking job there turning the club around. Uh, you've moved uh, here now to director of football. Uh, What's your job and title on a daily basis then? What do you oh, there's a lot involved in, in, in my role. It's, you know, right through. People see the force team, but there's a lot of other teams that are in the club as well. The club structure, obviously, we've got a force team. We've got a, the women's force team. We've got a women's academy, the boys' academy, school boys. So You've there's a huge, teams, there's a huge, right? yeah, there's yeah, a huge yeah, amount yeah. of teams here. And they're all thriving. It's all going well. Uh, so there's all issues with them. When you've got that amount of teams, there's a lot of stuff going on. So, yeah, it's a big job out with the force team. But it, you know, when I came in initially, it was to try to get some players in the door to strengthen the squad we had that Declan assembled and it's gone quite well so far. Uh, just like Sligo Rovers uh, here as Bohemians uh, you're all about community, you're community led in fact aren't you? Yeah absolutely and that's what I'm saying since I've been here even the last time as a manager the club has changed drastically um, they're doing Trojan work within the community, within the area and out with the area as well and you can see the development, obviously the stadium as well will be developed um, so it's all very positive, you know we've got brilliant training ground out in DCU as well so like I said there's a lot of work going on and people see the team but the amount of work going on in the club is, is fantastic uh, you need to be around the club day to day the amount of volunteers working in the place is Absolutely, incredible. you're doing a cracking job on, <clears throat> on the pitch but you're also doing a cracking job off the pitch, like even the jerseys there, we've got the Bob Marley jersey 
got the, the sign there, hate racism. Uh, a lot of the, um, a lot of young fellows from direct provision come in and play as well. And you reach out to the community, don't you? Absolutely, we've got to reach out to the community. I think most of the League of Ireland clubs are now in that mode. They're, they're reaching out. They know they've got to be vibrant in our own community. They're the people we want coming in. Like you said, the club does fantastic work. Our merchandise is incredible. Um, you know the, the, the amount of sales we have is fantastic so like I said you, you can get caught up with the team and it's important because that is the most important team what goes out there on a Friday night but the work going on and the rest of the club is, is brilliant Graham back to you Shamrock <laughs> Rovers were looking for a home for a long time and now they've got a fantastic one down talent South County Dublin don't they? Yeah it's fantastic it's everything you want in the league in the terms of the facilities they're building they're up and there's a fourth stand that should be finished by the summer to make it that when they go into the Europa League again or uh, qualifying for the Champions League it's sufficient but even the facilities that you're trying to build up there's a fantastic facility in Roadstone a lot of work went into that and it gives the players a base to go and train and that's all players want the players want a good place to go and train and they want a good place to go and play football but like Pat said, it's a, what can what can the club do for the community around it? You want people to come from the community and support your club, but you have to give something back as well. And Rovers have done that too. They've put in a fantastic stadium, a fantastic facility for all the local kids to play in, and it's brilliant. And right. Tal is thriving. I know you're a former Shamrock Rovers player. We're going to ask you boys to call it uh, for tomorrow <laughs> night. Uh, what are you saying, Pat? First, oh, listen. I think I've played in these games. I'm managing. They're brilliant games, and a lot of stuff can go out the window. It can be very frantic and frenetic early on. So. We're playing well. Rovers are starting to hear a bit of form. It could be anything. Give us I'd, an answer, will you? Yeah, well, I want the balls win. <laughs> what yeah, I'm going to go for balls win. I t- yeah, I think, it, like I said, a different animal turning up. Like, balls have been flying, but, like, Rovers are three times champions, but form goes out the window and this, I think, Rovers will come to town and put on a, put uh, on put a show. Put on a show. All right, so there you have it. A big night for the League of Ireland. Of course, a big night for Virgin Media Television broadcasting their first League of Ireland game. Uh, tomorrow night, Virgin Media 2 from 7.30. Uh, I've got the red and the black on. I'm living on the north side as well, so I've got to shout for Bowes. <laughs> oh, Bowes. Uh, behind any lines here. <laughs> Back to the studio. Absolutely. Uh, fair play to you. It's going to be a cracker of a match. It's great to see League of Ireland getting this platform as well. And it is tomorrow night, tomorrow night, 7.30. Alan Hughes will be there, front row, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course I will. Um, OK, that's what we have there now after the break. Brian Lloyd gives us his thoughts on Barbie. Barbie. Yes, you heard it right. Yes, he's going to give us his thumbs up or down for all the latest cinema and streaming releases. We'll see you back here in the same. Welcome back. Large claims being made here this morning mm. from video games brought to the big screen to Barbie's debut. There's a lot to look forward to when it comes to our viewing options. We've got the right man to do it. Entertainment.ie's Brian Lloyd is here with us making outlandish yes. statements about our first movie. Super Mario Brothers is back. Yeah. And you think that it... Is going to be the biggest film of the year box office-wise in Ireland. Guaranteeing like, it. Bigger than Avatar. Bigger than too Avatar. bigger than... Yep. I yeah. can't believe No, that. I mean, the reason for it is is that, like, it basically just will be in cinemas. Anytime there's a bank holiday weekend, anytime there's any kind of thing where it's like, OK, kids, get the car, we're going to the cinema. Cinemas will play this because okay. it is the kind of film that I think will appeal to both young and old. Okay. But I think kids will love it and they'll just keep watching it. Now, to they'll be fair, in the 90s, it. I went to see the Bob Hoskins John Same. Lick with yeah. no lie, like the actual film of Super Mario Brothers. This is an animated movie. Yes, yes. Uh, What is it about? It's essentially I just... I wonder. A, it's, it's a story of Super Mario Brothers. So Chris Pratt and Charlie Day play Mario and Luigi. They are struggling plumbers in New York. They stumble upon this pipe that transports them to the magical world of the Mushroom Kingdom. There they meet um, Prince. <laughs> yeah, well, we're laughing. Well, that's what's that's what's in the thing. Like it's, it's this is like this is this is settled history. Like you know, what I mean, I remember playing this when I was a kid. Yeah, like, yeah. don't but eat the I, magical I, mushrooms, kids. Hey. I, but, yeah, like I like Nintendo DSs are huge. Yeah, yeah, and Nintendo as well. Switch as well. Yeah. And Mario is just uh, that's it. Like I mean, it's that's the thing. Like when I was like five and six years old, I remember playing this on the NES, which was like this yeah. big yeah. kind of the big with the big cartridges you had to blow into them. And now kids are still playing Super Mario. I play Mario Kart against my nieces. There you go. I play Mario Kart still as well. I Same. love it. And there's a, section, there's a section in this when they're all in their carts driving towards um, Bowser's um, big uh, castle. castle thing, so are whatever. they basically, Bowser has, has he kidnapped Princess who's played by Anya Taylor-Joy? That's or? not even that. It's not even that. Bowser basically wants to get married to Princess Peach because he's in love with her. And Princess Peach is vo- voiced by Anya Taylor-Joy. Bowser is voiced by Jack Black. You have Fred Armisen in there. He's playing Cranky Kong. Seth Rogen plays Donkey Kong. 
So it's a lot of kind of like familiar voices in it, kind of playing all the characters, and that's kind of really can't be easy want. doing the voices. I'd say to be fair, to, you be know, to get it right. I mean, it's yeah. I mean, if people have a kind of preconceived notion about Mario should yeah. sound like, and then you've got Chris Pratt's voice coming out at it. Like now, okay. let's talk let's... about the controversy very quickly because yeah. Chris Pratt isn't of Italian descent, so it yeah. was cultural appropriation. No, it wasn't that? It wasn't. That I don't think it is. I think Surely it's insane. He's an it's actor. Not. No. Somebody who plays an Irish person. I yeah. agree. Yeah, I agree. Uh, that's no, weird. I, I I, was, I don't think it was cultural appropriation. The problem with a lot of people had was, was the fact that there was a voice actor who had voiced Mario for the past like 20 odd years. Oh. Charles Martinet was his name. Okay. Oh, okay. And he was kind of basically got pushed to one side and like, no, we're getting Chris Pratt in. Well, and people it's a big movie. They need That's it. it. Yeah. Okay. How did you rate it out of five? Three out of five. That's pretty good. Like, it's good. Like, it's, it's not. I, I, I'm very excited to be sitting here at the end of December and seeing if it's the highest gross and moving. I am telling you right now, it absolutely will be. Okay, let's move on. Air. So this is all about Nike and Michael Jordan. Mike, Nike and Michael Jordan, yeah. And essentially how this one guy, Sonny Vaccaro, who was kind of like a salesman for Nike, he managed to sign Michael Jordan. And at the time, Nike didn't have the best reputation with basketball. Like Adidas was kind of running the show for everybody. But then he, through his own self-belief, manages to sign Michael Jordan and actually bets the entire budget on Michael Jordan to get him. Okay. Uh, do we have a clip for this movie? Can we take it? We got I got it. I found him. Who's that? Jesus? Can't afford it. I'm willing to bet my career on one guy. My name's Sonny Vaccaro. I'm with Nike. Do you typically make it a habit of showing up at people's front doors unannounced? I don't like to take no for an answer. Oh, man. Here we go. You ask me what I do here. This is what I do. I find you players, and I feel it this time. Okay, it's risky. When you were selling sneakers out of the back of your Plymouth, that was risky. Don't change that now. For a rookie? Yes. Who's never set foot on an NBA court. That's the literal definition of rookie, yeah. We build a shoe line around just him. I need the greatest basketball shoe that's ever been made. Who's the player? Michael Jordan. Uh, okay, so we talked about Tetris last week. Yeah. We've talked about the founder in relation to McDonald's. Yeah. This is the Nike version of care about our business. Pretty much. Okay. Yeah, pretty much. Because it tells us the story. Like, we were saying it off every time we like, it's kind of hard to imagine Nike being an underdog. Yeah. But that's really what they were going for here. They were trying to kind of pitch the whole idea that, you know, Nike was only known for running shoes and that it wasn't known for basketball. And that if they didn't kind of sign Michael Jordan, they the entire gone. division would have been shut down. That well, listen, okay. if you read uh, Phil Knight's book, Shoe Dog, Shoe Dog which yeah. I really enjoyed, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that is actually the case because they yeah. were an up and coming up against the likes of Converse and Adidas yeah. were huge at the time. But this doesn't paint him in a great picture who played by Ben Affleck, but... Well, I mean, I wouldn't say... It's, it's not that it doesn't paint him in a... Yeah, it does, it does in a way. It makes him very kind of egotistical, I would say. Okay. Which what, I think is you, fair. What are you giving it out of five? Three out of five. Okay. Oh, um, Operation Fortune, it's the new Guy Ritchie film. We're not going to talk about it because you really disliked it so much. Uh, I think you gave it, like, zero stars. Which is oh. so disappointing. For yes. Guy Ritchie. It really is. Yeah. You, Grant, like, everyone's in this. We do want to talk about the Barbie trailer. <laughs> so this was released the other day and this is the Greta Gerwig film. It uh -huh. stars absolutely everyone and the trailer yeah. has been talked about non-stop all week. Yes, it absolutely has. And I mean, there's already, and we're talking about big, bold claims, would not be surprised in the slightest if this was in the Oscars. It should be in the. I, of course, it's I, I think be in it the would Oscars. be. You're la I know you're <laughs> laughing, right? Come on. No, I'm telling you right now. Greta Gerwig uh, is a big Oscar favorite. Her uh, husband, partner, Noah, Noah Baumbach. Baumbach. Noah Baumbach. Again, been in the Oscars loads of time. He wrote this as well. I would not be surprised if we're talking about this uh, Oscars like, because for it best is best picture. Well, maybe for best picture, but like, act. yeah, best screenplay or something like that. Yeah. I, I mean, for it. Ryan Gosling, to be fair, the amount he crunches over. To show his I six mean, pack. To get the six pack. Yeah, the trailer that, I mean, is incredibly funny. It's so funny. It is. It's very, very funny. Even the teaser trailer, the one where it's like she's the she's giant, this woman. giant yeah, woman. Yeah, I mean, after doing the two thousand. So thing. basically, Barbie gets kicked out of Barbie Land into the real world. She's got to come back and save Barbie. She's got to. Well, I mean, we don't know. We don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. When is it out? It's out July twenty first. Oh, okay. I am going to get Barbie cord out. I'm really looking yeah. forward to it. Brian Lloyd for entertainment.ie. Thank you so thank much you. for that. Thank you, Alan. What have we got to look forward to on Saturday? Yes, uh, besides the Bose match, because. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. That's on Friday. Friday. That's, That's on Friday, yeah. Um, there's a, I'll be in the stands here. I think there I am. There we <laughs> <I> go. There. <laughs> Cheering them on. Cheering them on. <laughs> Bringing the flares with yeah. you. Now, of course, we won't be here tomorrow, but we will be in, I'll be in Daily Mount Park, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but coming up on Saturday's show, Sarah Ferguson, the Duchess of York, 
will be here with uh, telling us about her royal memoir. Sarah Fagan from Sarah, down the road. Sarah That's Fagan. her, Sarah Fagan. Yeah, comes straight from Dolly Mount. <laughs> We're going to find Dolly out Mount. how much hidden sugar is in your Easter eggs, plus hacks to make it the spring clean that little bit easier. And with all the hype, we made Ireland's biggest Barbie collector. That's all coming up on Saturday's Ireland AM from 9. Have a Happy great Easter. bank holiday weekend. Absolutely. Be safe. Enjoy.